Okay, good morning, everyone. Welcome to BC213, the course on end times. Thank you for joining the class today. Those of you in the classroom, those of you online, thank you. Let's take a moment to pray together and we'll get started. Could somebody please pray? Hello, Father, thank you for this wonderful time, Father. Thank you for you are with us. Thank you for everything you're doing. Lord Jesus, pray for this action we are praying. Lord Jesus, we need concentration. Please help us and help the pastor to teach us the mysteries of your scripture, Lord. The mysteries of your coming back. Lord Jesus, we all are waiting for that. We want to see more. Thank you for everything. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Hmm. I couldn't um, hear the audio. So that means this is not serving its purpose. Oh, I should have changed my settings, you know? Speaker. Um, yeah, yeah. Anyway, let's leave it. All right. So these speakers are not working. Maybe I should try one minute. Let me just try putting this on. And then change the settings here. To the AirPods. OK. Sorry? Yeah, yeah, I changed that to all AirPods. Yeah. Okay. Um, let's get started. Let's go to um, uh, chapter four, where we stopped last week. And uh, let me just go ahead and share the notes. All right, so we went through the timeline and we started talking about the rapture of the church. We went through the scriptures that talk about the rapture of the church, what will happen. Uh, we talked about the trumpet of God. And we talked about, or we just mentioned, what believers will do in heaven during those seven years. So let's take a few minutes on this. I'm sorry, there's a big, loud, very loud aeroplane flying. Just turn it off. Okay, so let's uh, let's just talk about what believers will be doing in heaven uh, during these seven years. So this is on page fifty-six. Page fifty-six. All right. So right after the rapture, um, we are going to meet the Lord in the air. And we're going to be taken up to be with him in heaven for seven years. And during those seven years, there will be seven years of tribulation here on earth. So what's going to happen in heaven during the seven years? What do the scriptures tell us? So here are some things we can see. The Bible tells us, Colossians 3, 4, that we will be with him in glory. Right. So we are going to be with him in his presence. We will see him as he is. We will be like him, living in glorified bodies. So our bodies are going to be like his. We explained that last week. And we will know God as we are known. Um, what does that sentence mean? Uh, again, to comprehend that, uh, I, I still am not sure. But it just seems to indicate that there's going to be a recognition of God 
and a, uh, and a knowledge of God much beyond what we have right now. Right? Uh, it doesn't mean we will know as God knows. Right? So like we said, that's omniscience. Right? So it's not like you're going to know as God knows. But we're, we're going to know him in a greater measure, in a greater sense right? than what we know right now. Uh, we will be welcomed into our mansions. We saw Jesus saying, I'm going to prepare a place for you. I'll come and receive you for my, to myself. Uh, we're going to be in mansions in heaven. Um, we, there is going to be the judgment of the believers. So we will, let's look at this. Let's turn, please, to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. What did the Apostle Paul write about the believer's judgment? So this is where the believers are going to be judged. Right? So when we are in heaven, there will be a judgment. And this is not a judgment for salvation, but this is a judgment for our works, for our service, for our ministry. Okay? So 1 Corinthians 3, 13 to... Please, somebody can read that for us. Or oh, let's not verse 13. Uh, let's read from verse 11, please. First Corinthians chapter 3, 11 to 15. God First Corinthians chapter 3, verse 11 to 15. But no other foundation can anyone lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if anyone builds on his foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each one's work will become clear. For the day will declare it, because it will be revealed by fire, and the fire will test each one's work of what sort it is. If anyone's work which he has built on it endures, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved at so as through fire. So, um, notice Paul is telling us that uh, we believers, our works are going to be tested. So we have a foundation. It is Jesus Christ. Okay, And our works will be tested. Each one's work will be tested. Fire will test each one's work of what sort it is. That means God is going to test it. Now, it doesn't mean like, you know, imagine some fire in the middle and all our works are going through it. It's not that. He's just telling us that God is going to himself assess our works and give us a reward for those works. Right? And um, uh, let's also read, let's also read 2 Corinthians 5 so that uh, we'll, we'll put it together. We'll come back to uh, this passage, but I just want us to see uh, that uh, about the judgment here, the believer's judgment. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses uh, 9 and 10. 2 Corinthians 5, 9 and 10. Somebody could read it. Therefore, we make it our aim, whether present or absent, to be well-pleasing to him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. So, Paul is writing to believers. And he's saying, we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. So, see the difference in the language. This is talking about judgment seat of Christ. Revelation chapter 20 talks about great white throne judgment. So don't confuse the two. Right? They are different. Okay. Revelation is great white throne judgment. Here is judgment seat of Christ. Okay. This judgment seat, the judgment seat of Christ is where all the believers are standing before Jesus. The great white throne judgment in Revelation 20 is every human person is standing. The sea gives up the dead, everyone, good or bad, everybody is standing before God. Okay, So this judgment we refer to as the believer's judgment, or in some places you will read as the Bema seat judgment, B-E-M-A, Bema 
seat judgment. Why? Because the Greek here um, in verse 10, we must appear before the judgment seat of Christ. That judgment seat in the Greek is bemma. Right? It's a Greek word where uh, Paul is bo borrowing from uh, the judgment they used to have in those days, which was in the public city square. This was a public, you know, the, the when, when people had some disputes, they would go in the city square in the middle of the city where they they had a like a judge sitting, a bema seat, and he would sit and judge the disputes. Okay, so he's using that language here. So sometimes people say, "Oh, bema seat" or whatever. It's nothing. It's just a Greek word that's used in Second Corinthians five ten, referring to the judgment of the believers. Okay, and uh, how is this going to be? So now we go back to First Corinthians three. Uh, we all have the same foundation, which is Jesus Christ. Um, and the work, what we, how we built, will be tested, right? He's saying if you build with gold, silver, and precious stones, it will remain. If you build with wood, hay, and straw, it will be burnt, right? So, what is wood, hay, and straw? What is gold, silver, and precious stones? We can just say that this is a type, it's representing something. Wood, hay, and stubble represents the flesh. Things of the flesh. Gold, silver, precious stones representing what is divine, what is from God. Okay. So, for example, can you think of a verse where uh, wood, hay, stubble is representing things of the world which God, which will burn up? Yes. Yes, correct, correct. Matthew 3.11, right? So John the Baptist in introducing the ministry of Jesus. He says, he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. And what will that fire do? He continues, right? He will burn up the chaff, chaff, right? Uh, whose winnowing fan is in his hand. That means the, like, you know, the farmer, how they separate the wheat from the... The, the 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 covering of the grain, you know, the chaff. They 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 separate the wheat and the chaff. Then all the chaff collects and then they burn it up. The husk, you know, that thing which they don't want. So he says his winnowing fan is in his hand. He'll separate the wheat from the chaff, and he will burn the chaff with unquenchable fire. So the Holy Spirit is working, separating what is good and bad. And what is bad, he'll burn. So we can say that, see, that's an example, another place where uh, what is not of God is referred to by this image of wheat, uh, of a chaff, right? So wood, hay, hay is what, same as chaff, hay. The separate, you know, the things that you, you take the grain off, then you get the hay, hay, chaff. So that represents the things of the flesh. So. We do a lot of things. We do a lot of works. All kinds of works we do. But God is going to see what works we did which were inspired by Him, the Holy Spirit, and what works came from the flesh. And the works of the flesh are going to be burned up. And so only the real works, the works that came from God, for that each man will receive a re reward. Um, he will receive a reward. Verse 14. But if anyone's work is burned, he will suffer loss. That means if it's burned, okay, no reward for that. Because God said that was all flesh, no reward for it. But you will be saved, verse 15. He will be saved. This is not about whether or not he's going to be saved. This is about what reward he's going to get. You understand, right? So that's the difference here between um, the Bemasi judgment and the great white throne judgment. All right. So this is how believers are going to be judged. So in the light of that, what we must do is make sure that the works we do are works that are born of the born of God or born of the Spirit, right? Because we can do a lot of things uh, which are good, um, but they may not be what God wants, or they may be good. 
in the sense that, yeah, I'm doing some ministry work, something I'm doing. But it may be producing the fruit of the flesh. So what do you mean? I may be doing something, but it's causing division. Okay, I'm, I'm doing something, but the fruit is, it is dividing. It is, or I'm doing something, but it is causing uh, hate or is causing hurt. I may be doing something good or so-called good, but what is the fruit? Right? Or I may be doing something good, but is the fruit moving? Is the fruit moving people towards the Lord, towards God, towards His Word, or is it moving away? It is. Is it drawing them to me? Example: I'm preaching. Suppose I'm preaching. After my preaching, people say, "Oh, I like pastor so much." That is not the purpose of preaching, right? The purpose of preaching is people should say, "I love God, I love His Word, uh, I love, I want to worship, I want to follow Jesus," right? So um, that is the fruit, and right? if the fruit, I may be preaching great, but what is the fruit? Are people being pointed to Jesus? Are people being drawn to His Word? Are people being drawn? to him as opposed to being drawn to me or if after I preach they say wow he preached so nicely what's the point right? that is not the fruit we want to bear right what is the fruit we want to bear lives must be changed uh, people must be drawn closer to the Lord right so that's the fruit we should look for otherwise it's going to be wood hay and stubble it may look all nice it may look nice but God is not you know, God is not looking at that. He said, is it from me? Right? Is it from the law? Uh, and what is the fruit you bear? Right? So we have to be careful in the work we do. Many times you also see in Christian ministry, people do things out of competition. You know, Paul wrote about it in Philippians 1. He said, some preach Christ out of jealousy. They're jealous with, of Paul and they're preaching. Some preach Christ out of contention. They want to compete. They're preaching Jesus. But what is motivating them? I want to be better than Paul. Paul wrote about it in Philippians 1. And Paul says, it's okay. He's, see, he can't do anything about it. He says, I'm just happy that Christ is being preached. <laughs> I'm happy Christ is being preached. But God will look at it differently. You know, because uh, Paul writes First Corinthians four. Uh, if you look at, yeah, we're there right now. First Corinthians four, and verse four, or verse five, he says, "God will reveal the counsel of the hearts. Then each one's praise will come from God." First Corinthians four five. So, how is God going to judge? He's going to judge according to the motive of the heart, and then your praise will come from God. Right? What was the motive of your heart? And what you did, what you did. What was the motive? Sometimes, uh, you know, I'm, I'm talking about us Christian preachers also. We preach because we want to be famous. We preach because we want to be well known. We preach because we want to have a bigger platform. See, these other people don't see the outside. They only look at the sermon. They only listen to the thing. But only God knows our. And only God knows our hearts. And. So our works will be tested. God will judge us according to the motive of our hearts. And each one's reward will be given. Right? So we have to be careful on that. So that's the, just the judgment of the believers. Yeah. Look at our hearts and heals it. So uh, why can't uh, th that's happening now? Like there are preachers who want them to be in a big position and they're doing it for their self and why God is not judging them and on the other side they are being blessed like nothing and their ministry is being blessed and there are many ministries that we couldn't even know that they are doing things like very opposite to God but they are being blessed they, ha they are having a biggest congregations you know. so why they are not being judged yeah um, I mean when we look at 
history, like when you look backwards, what we can say is God is very patient. God is very patient. He gives people, us, a lot of time to repent. A lot of time. But at some point, he will, uh, that, current, that judgment will come. Because Peter wrote, judgment will begin in the house of God. It will begin where judgment begins in the house of God. But God gives us uh, gives a lot of uh, grace, like a lot of time to repent. So when you, if you should look back, um, we see so many of these ministries. They become very big. They, you know, it's all this like like you're saying. They become big. They have big congregation, lots of money. This that no. And then, but actually, sometimes these different preachers are. I'm not saying everybody is, I don't think everybody is bad. <laughs> That's not what we are saying. I'm just saying you know, there are some examples where sometimes they are, they may be doing something wrong and it's not visible. Like people don't know, right? People are only seeing the big ministry. They're only seeing the preaching. They're only seeing everything outside, but behind something. Wrong. What we have seen is sometimes after 20 years, you know, 25 years, sometimes, something like Suddenly, the whole thing is brought to light. So we may ask, why did why did God wait twenty years, twenty five years, sometimes thirty years before this thing? Why? Only thing we can think of is God was giving them time to repent. God was giving them grace to correct themselves. If they so, Bible says, First Corinthians ten. 11. If we judge ourselves, we will not be judged. That means, see, we all do something wrong. If you do something wrong, you judge yourself. God, I was wrong. I'm sorry. I correct myself. Go. If we judge ourselves, we will not be judged. But God is giving so much time, they're not correcting themselves, then finally. But the problem with that is so many people are affected. Because by that time, the ministry is so big. You know, you can have hundreds, uh, literally thousands and thousands of people who have, you know, put so much of trust in that ministry. And then when something is thing, you know, so many people are hurt. But it's not God's fault. It's that God was being gracious and giving time to repent. But in the end, you know, judgment must begin in the house of God. And we see when you look back, you see this thing happening over and over again. All right. Yeah. Oh, we are talking about this so works of flesh, or like things that we do out not birth from birth from spirit, but by our own. And sometimes uh, like my question is like is it the motives of what we are doing matters or even if we are doing it like if it's not from god but i want to do and i did it and it was only building the church equipping people will it be burned because it is from my own i did it but it's not god want me to do it but the thing that i did out of my own glorified god and i don't have any wrong intentions in it I'm doing something good. I'm doing something that is building people. I'm doing something that is serving God. But I did. Huh? Mm, it wasn't what God wanted. As far as I can say, I'm thinking of Matthew chapter 7. Okay. And also I'm looking at the example of Jesus. Jesus, many times he said, I can of my own self do nothing. Hmm? So John 5.19. I can, John chapter 5.19. I can of my own self do nothing as I see. 
I judge, you know. And uh, what does his father do? Most of Shulay said, the son can do nothing of himself, what he sees the father do, for whatever he does, so also does the son. So, the way Jesus lived, he only chose to do what he saw the father do. That was how he lived. Now in Matthew 7, Jesus is rebuking those people, and one of the reasons he says is, you did not do the will of my father. So the emphasis there is, you must do the will of the father. Right? Um, verse, no, uh, verse 21, Matthew 7, 21. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my father in heaven. Will of my father. The emphasis is, do the will of my, what my father will. So these people are saying, Lord, Lord. In your name we prophesied. In your name we did this. We, so that means they did the good things. They did supernatural things. They used the name of Jesus to heal, deliver, prophesy, do all that. But first issue, will of my father. Now, is it the father's will to heal the sick, to cast out demons, to raise? Of course it is. Generally, yes. But still he is saying to these people, you must, you didn't do the will of my father. That means, so we are trying to imagine, like, you know, how is this possible? How is this possible? That it is the will of the father to do these things in the name of Jesus. But yet how can he say to these people who are saying, Lord, in your name we have prophesied, in your name we have healed, in your name we have done all this. How can he say to them, you didn't do the will of my father? So, and then of course the other thing is, I never knew you, verse 23. So two issues, right? You didn't do the will of my father. I never knew you. And he's saying, because of that, whatever they were doing in the name of the Lord, they were actually practicing lawlessness. They were practicing sin. Yeah, that is verse uh, 23. So for us, in our mind, it's so difficult. How can these people be said? How can you say to these people who in your name were doing all these supernatural works and Lord, you're finding this problem. They didn't do the will of the Father. They didn't know you. Or you didn't know them. And they were actually practicing sin. Right? So that's why we have to be very careful. So uh, meaning people can do good things using the name of Jesus, but that may not be what God wants them to do. And it may not be, their motivation would not have been to glorify Jesus. They were practicing sin. The motivation may be to self, money, this, that, all those things. So it's said. I think so. See, not correct. So example, see, I know God wants to heal every person, just as God wants to save every person. No question. Like example, I don't have to ask God, God, do you want that person to be saved or not? Because Jesus died for that person. I have to take the gospel. It is his decision, but my responsibility is to take the gospel to every creature. God wants to heal every sick person, no question, because Jesus bore all our sickness and diseases. He is the he, Psalm, Psalm says, he heals me of all my diseases. So I know God wants to heal. But if I am preaching the gospel, or I am 
ministering to the sick, or whatever good thing. But my motivation is not really to glorify Jesus, but to glorify myself. I am sinning. I'll give you chapter and verse. John 7, verse 18. John 7. I know we're going off in a different direction. <laughs> but you see this. John 7, verse 18. We're talking about the believer's judgment now. John 7, verse 18. Somebody could read it. John 7, verse 18. John chapter 7, verse 18. He who speaks on his own does so to gain honor for himself. But he who works for the honor of the one who sent him is a man of truth. There is nothing false about him. If he's speaking for himself, he's seeking his own glory. I want to be. But if he is seeking the glory of the one who sent him, then he is a true Then there is no stating. Or you can flip it like this. If he is seeking his own glory, then he is a false witness. And there is sin in him. That's what this verse is saying. If somebody's been sent and he's seeking the glory of the one who sent him, he's a true witness. There is no sin. But somebody has sent him, but he's seeking his own glory. Then he's a false witness and there is sin. So that is the issue. Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, so, so what we'll be doing in heaven, back to page um, 56, uh, we'll be engaging in worship. Uh, we see that in the book of Revelation. You'll be standing before the throne. We are worshiping as kings and priests. Another thing that will happen during those seven years is uh, tribulation martyrs. That is, people who are being believers, who are being killed on the earth. We see them, their souls or their spirit and soul coming up into heaven before the throne of God. And you see that in Revelation 6 and 7. They're coming before the throne of God. They are worshipping God. So they will be joining with them in worship. And um, the other thing we see is there's going to be this marriage of the Lamb, the marriage supper of the Lamb, Revelation 19. So that is the last thing that takes place in heaven at the end of the tribulation. It is mapping to the end of the tribulation. On earth, we are coming to the end of the tribulation. In heaven, at that moment, Revelation 19, there is a marriage supper of the Lamb. That means the bride, which is all of God's people, they are referred to as a bride. The bride has made herself ready. They, they are all seated. And there is this great celebration together. I mean, I don't know how, what is <laughs> The Bible just says there is a great marriage supper of the Lamb. Some sort of a celebration, right? Uh, what is going to happen in details and all, we don't know. But that is the last thing. Right after that, Jesus returns, the second coming. Okay. Now, as part of our rewards, and this is just a side note, um, the New Testament talks about different kinds of crowns. The crown is signifying a reward. You know, in those days especially, they should not give medals or trophies. They will give crowns. Sometimes it's as simple as a, a wreath, you know, like two uh, uh, branches they put on the head. It's saying like you're a winner or you place a crown. You're a winner. So the Bible has that picture. And then different kinds of crowns we see. There's a crown of righteousness. Um, there is an imp imperishable crown, a crown of rejoicing, a crown of life a crown of glory, and so on. So different kinds of crowns. Now, um, you know, understand that 
Okay, it doesn't mean like you know you'll have three, four crowns on your head <laughs> trying to balance it. <laughs> and you're walking around, hey, you got crown of light, you got crown of glory. <laughs> balance. I don't I don't think we have to worry about that, you know. But it's just saying that these are part of the rewards. There's a way that God is going to bestow a reward or an honor on uh, his people who served him well, you know. Uh, so just for us to know that. Okay. All right. Let me let me pause here and see if there are any questions. Now, what we're going to do is we are going to talk about why we say there's a pre-tribulation rapture of the church. Why we're going to say that. But let me just see if there are any questions on the chat, online students. Many questions. Okay. Uh, 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 please repeat the verse about God's will. Yeah, Matthew chapter 7, we were looking at that. Uh, Matthew 7, I think it was 21 to 23. Matthew 7, 21 to 23. Any other questions from online students? Okay. Any questions from here? All right, so now let's move on to talk about why do we say there's a pre-tribulation rapture of the church. Now, you know, this has been an area where believers keep fighting with each other. <laughs> there are so many topics people fight. This is one of those big topics because some say before the tribulation, some will say middle of the tribulation. Some will say end of the tribulation. So that discussion has been going on for a long time. It's been going on. And even today, you know, you might meet somebody outside. They will say something else. Oh, no, 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 you're wrong. Uh, the rapture will happen only after the tribulation, whatever. It's okay. Um, my response is, okay, I will listen to what you have to say. I'll see if there's anything uh, valid. But according to what I have studied and according to what I'm seeing, this is what I believe, and I can explain it to you. Right? You explain to me, I'll explain to you. And each one is left to decide what you feel like. I mean, we're not, we don't have to fight over this. Uh, we don't have to you know, become enemies over this. Uh, it's okay. You have a different view, I have a different view, it's fine. But sometimes people get very, you know, people get very harsh and they write books and uh, they become very mean when they're fighting on these things. So we shouldn't get into those kinds of things. Leave it, you know. If people ask us, we can explain. This is why we say there is a pre-tribulation rapture of the church. Okay? So we'll give some reasons. The first one is... Uh, and this, you know, all of these are important. So um, it's not like uh, uh, one is more important than the other, but all these things add up to showing us that, uh, you know, th there is a pre-tribulation rapture of the church. So let's go to Second Thessalonians chapter two, verses one to ten, and let's read. So. Paul is writing, and uh, remember that first and second, sorry, first and second Thessalonians were among were among Paul's earliest epistles that he wrote. Okay, the first set of epistles, earliest epistles that he wrote, first and second Thessalonians. In first Thessalonians. He has described the rapture, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. He has already described the rapture. What will happen? The Lord will descend. He will bring with those uh, who have died or fallen asleep. He will bring with him. Then we who are alive and remain will caught, be caught up together and meet the Lord in the air. Hmm? 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, 13 to 18. He has described that. So we will meet the Lord in the air. Described. First Thessalonians chapter 5, he has mentioned, brethren, this will come suddenly, like a thief in the night. 
So always live ready. Live as children of light. Be always ready. And God will save us from the day of wrath. He's mentioned it. First Thessalonians chapter 5. But remember, when he's writing his letter, he's writing like a continuous thing. He's not writing in chapter and verse, right? Only now we are referencing chapter and verse. But he had written it. So he has given that in the first letter. Now he's writing another one. Because there is still confusion among the believers saying, hey, it has already happened. Rapture has already happened, and we all missed it. Do you imagine no? believers there? They're very scared now. Somebody said, Paul wrote, Rapture will happen. That has already happened. We've all missed it. We are left here. Confusion. So he's addressing that. He's clarifying when that is going to happen. Okay, so let us read 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses. 1 to 10, please. Somebody could read it. Second Thessalonians 2, 1 to 10. Concerning the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered to him, we ask you, brothers, not to become easily unsettled or alarmed by someone, some prophecy, report, or letter supposed to have coming from us. Concerning our gathering together to him. Our gathering together to him. So what's he referring to? The rapture. Mm -hmm. So he's saying concerning the rapture. So this is very clear. Concerning the rapture, verse 1. Our gathering together to him. Because that is in reference to 1 Thessalonians 4, 13, 18. Concerning our gathering together to him. Don't be troubled. Somebody has come and given you a prophecy, given you a letter that they said he wrote it on. Don't be troubled by that. So somebody has caused confusion. They have brought in some ideas. Uh oh, or this like this or something. But actually, it's wrong. It's causing confusion. He's trying to clarify. So how does he do this? Let no one deceive you by any means. For the day will not come unless the falling away comes first and the man of sin is revealed and the son of prediction tradition who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called god or what is worshiped so that he sits as god in the temple of the god showing himself that he is god Three and four. Three and four. no one to see you because that day what day our gathering together to him. It won't come unless certain things happen. What? First, there will be a great falling away. Falling away means a lot of people leaving the faith. Today, actually, I, I don't know about you, but I, I, I kind of keep in touch of what's happening in the Western church. And we can say, but what we are seeing in the Western Church, when I say Western Church, North America, Europe, we are seeing a great falling away. And this is not just somebody guessing. They have data. The last 30 years, more people have left the church. And they, they don't call them, they call themselves non-religious. They don't even call themselves Christian. I am non what is your religion? No religion. Non-religious. And people have been leaving the church. They said this trend has been going on last 30 years. So these are the countries which we think are Christian nests. But it is like great falling out, huge number. And they have the number also. Somebody's estimated, I forgot what I read, but some so many million people have left the church in the last 30 years. These are people who are, you know, either them or their parents were going to church. A lot of a lot of factors have come in contributing to this. But we are seeing a great falling away. Literally. You know, 
especially among the Christian nations, or nations that were once supposedly Christian. Okay, so great falling away. Then he says, And the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition. So who is he talking about? He's referring back to what Daniel spoke. Okay, so we will study next year, chapter and verse, verse chapter by chapter, verse by verse, the book of Daniel. And in Daniel chapter 7, chapter 8, chapter 9, very detailed, he talks, Daniel, God first, God reveals to Daniel in detail about this man of sin, referring to the Antichrist. So that's what Paul is referring to. He said, this man of sin will be revealed, the son of perdition, and he is going to sit in the temple of God. Now Daniel already prophesied what he's going to do. Okay, Daniel already told us, gave us all details. He said he will establish a covenant of peace for seven years. And in the middle of the seven years, he will break the covenant of peace. So Daniel has already given all the details. And Paul is referring to that. He's saying, this man of sin has to be become ready. Because he's going to sit in the temple of God. That means the gathering, the day of the Lord, for us gathering together, is going to be right at that moment. There's going to be great falling away. This man of sin is ready. Last seven years will start. But let's read on. Let's read on. So it's a man of sin. And the other thing I can we can point out is there only because he says in verse uh, yeah, verse five, verse four in the temple of God. There has to be also a temple. temple. That also has to come to this. So all these things he's talking about. Let's read verse five. Verse five. Do you not remember that when I was still with you, I told you these things? And now you know what is restraining, that he may be revealed in his own time. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Now he who only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. And then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. Then the coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan, with all powers, signs, and lying wonders, and with all unrighteous deceptions among those who perish, because they did not receive the love of the truth, that they might be saved. So, Paul is saying, verse 5, brothers, I already told you about all these things, so don't get confused. Now, verse 6, and now... Okay, here's the thing. There is something restraining. There is something holding back this lawless one from being revealed. Right? And verse 7, it, the lawlessness is already at work. Verse 7, only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way and then the lawless one will be revealed. So that is the piece of text that people have fought about. Who is he? Who is that he that Paul is referring to? Because very clearly he's saying, see, somebody's holding, preventing the man of sin from being revealed. He has to be taken out of the way. Then this man of sin will be, then the seven years starts. So the question is, who is he who is now preventing the lawless one, this man of sin, the son of perdition, the antichrist, the little horn? Who is he who is preventing this person from being revealed? That is a big question. So this is where... Uh, you know, we have to discuss. So we have two options. I mean, generally speaking, if you read, you know, what people write generally, some will say he refers to the Holy Spirit. But I want to present that, and I'll give you a reason, that he represents the church. I'll tell you why. 
Now, immediately we said, no, it cannot be the church because church is the bride of Christ. Oh. See, see, see. <laughs> but church is the body of Christ. That is he. That is masculine. Correct. So church is bride, she. Body, he. <laughs> right. So... Uh, we have to be open to that. We are so used to thinking church as the bride, which is correct. That is one of the pictures. It doesn't mean church is a lady. It's only a picture representing Christ's relationship with the church. We have so many other pictures of the church. The church is like a family. The church is like an army. The church is like a house of prayer and worship. All that. These are only pictures of the church. One of the pictures is the body of Christ. Body of Christ. It's he, masculine. Okay. So, ponder over that, over coffee. <laughs> we'll, we'll, go for, we'll go for a break and come back. Yeah. Thank you.